Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We have two heroes that are going to speak to us uh, tonight. Jess Kalb is one of three women that took the Kentucky uh, Attorney General Office uh, to the Supreme Court in order to regain abortion access. The other two plaintiffs are Sarah Barron and Lisa Berlow. This case is unique because it claims that the current laws violate our religious freedom as Jews. And Aaron Kemper is one of the two lawyers representing these brave women in this case. The other lawyer is Ben Potash. Between the five people involved, they have six daughters. One of the driving forces behind this lawsuit is not only the safety of women today, but also planning for the health and safety of women in the Commonwealth of Kentucky in the future. Jess and the other women in the case received the Jewish Voice for Choice Award last year, and the lawyers received the Presidential Award for Service for their work on this case. Thank you. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shabbat shalom. Hope you'll forgive me. I'm a little nervous, but it's wonderful to see so many friendly faces. So thanks for being here. Um, the temple has become a home to me. I work here Monday through Friday, and I've even found a home here on Sundays teaching Jewish cooking. A couple weeks ago, Rabbi David asked our seventh and eighth grade students what it meant to be open-minded. And one of the kids chimed up, wise beyond their years, and said, in order to be open-minded, you have to accept that you're not the smartest person about that topic. So, <laughs> I want to start this with some wisdom from my seventh graders and recognize that I am not the smartest person about reproductive rights in the state of Kentucky. I'm not going to stand up here and try to speak to the religious implications. I'll let Rabbi David do that. I'm not going to stand up here and try to speak to the legal ramifications of this case. Aaron can handle that load. But I'm going to go ahead and talk to you guys about what I've experienced as a woman in this state and what that's looked like for me. One thing you should know about my experience is when we started this case over a year ago, I got the same question, and I still get that question today. And the question is, why would someone like you, someone who wants to be a mom so badly, want, normal, want to normalize legal abortions? It's a hard question to answer because there's not one answer. So I'll just tell you why I need access to abortion. I have PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. The World Health Organization estimates about 13% of all women of childbearing age have PCOS. To put that in perspective, that's about 5 million people in the U.S. alone. 5 million people with ovaries in the U.S. have the same condition. PCOS is a hormonal condition. It does a lot of things within my body. Um, women with PCOS develop diabetes at a rate of about 50% before they turn 40. It will shorten my lifespan by an average of 15 years and it has caused what they call subfertility. This means for me, I can get pregnant, but I can't stay pregnant without medical intervention. To find my daughter, the best daughter on the planet, <laughs> it took years of fertility treatments, including IVF. The CDC estimates that one in three pregnancies will end in miscarriage. That's a really important giant number. But for women like me, for those five million women that I just discussed, those, stack, those odds stack a little differently. I have had one perfect, amazing pregnancy, resulting in that wonderful daughter that I just spoke about. I've also had at least 17 miscarriages. I say at least because at some point it started hurting too much to test and to count. That's important to know because of those 17 miscarriages that I know, that I counted, that I tested, I needed medical intervention for five. I ended up at a doctor's office or the hospital five times needing what the state of Kentucky would classify today as an abortion. So without access to those abortions, what would my life have looked like? I would have been forced into an impossibly cruel, inhumane situation where I had two options, three if you count leaving our state, but two here in Kentucky. The first option would be to carry a fetus to term that I know I will never bring home, all the way to term. 
The other option, sorry, the other option would be to wait for my body to go completely septic and my organs to start shutting down. So I want to try something with here with you guys tonight, if you're willing and able, and if you can and are comfortable, if you've ever known or loved or do know someone who's ever had a miscarriage or needed an abortion, please stand. So take a moment to look around because I want everyone to see that this is not a rarity. This is a reality in our state. Women need this care. Now, as you sit down, I'd like for you to keep that person in your mind. I want you to imagine that person that you just told me you know or you love being forced to carry a fetus to term that they know they will never take home. I want you to imagine those moments in the grocery store and at work as that woman's body changes and it becomes completely apparent to everyone around her that she's having a baby, but she knows it'll never come home. Those well-meaning questions of, are you excited? Is it a boy or a girl? Imagine the emotional and the psychological impact of that situation. The other situation I outlined is waiting for your body to become septic. That's the other option in the cases like mine where there was a heartbeat, and I say that in quotes because it's an electrical impulse, there's no differentiated heart tissue. Um, but if there is a heartbeat, I would be forced to wait for my body to go septic. If your body goes septic, it impacts your organs for the rest of your life. That impact includes and is not limited to becoming sterile after that instance, which means that a woman like me who's fought to have a child and wants to have another is forced with these options. Possibly lose fertility altogether, go sterile. Watch my body grow and change, grieving the entire time, waiting for the inevitable to happen, or leave the state. And so many people say, well, you could do it. You could have a baby because you can go to Illinois if you needed assistance. I want you to imagine the saddest day of your life being separated from your entire support system, because that's what we're doing to women in Kentucky right now. But on a lighter note, as a Jew, my favorite thing about my religion is that we are all called to fix what is broken in our world. And so when this legislation changed, when Roe was overturned, Lisa and I got on the phone and figured out how we were going to try to do this. So now our, our case has stalled. Aaron will speak more to our case and to the specifics of that, but we've been in courts in waiting for over a year now. Our case is stalled. But I didn't want to leave you guys all just knowing that our case had stalled. I want you to know what you can do to help. There's real impact in the following ways. One, be loud in quiet spaces. Have big, loud conversations with people who you think might be open-minded enough to realize they don't know everything about the intricacies of healthcare. Talk about it. Break that taboo. I know abortion is not something you want to talk about. As the poster child for abortion rights right now, I know this is a hard thing to talk about, but do it. Vote accordingly. Talk to people who you don't see eye to eye with. Help them understand why it's so important to vote accordingly. What I need from everyone sitting here tonight is to promise to say something at some point about this issue. To not just sit here and listen to me talk, but to speak yourself. It's important to bring more people's awareness to the intricacies, to the reality that not all abortions are about not having a baby. Way too often, they're about wanting a child. I would also really appreciate it if through your voting and through your efforts, you could correct this. Because unfortunately, the condition I have is genetic. That perfect daughter will probably struggle with the same thing. And I want this legislation corrected before she has to stand up here and speak for Repro Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom. Hello, uh, my name is Aaron Kemper. I'd like to thank the temple um, for allowing Jessica and I to speak tonight about our lawsuit. I'd like to thank the uh, NCJW National 
Oh, sorry. All right, it's too low. There we go. I'm, 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 a, I'm a little bit taller. Okay. I'd like to thank the National Council for Jewish Women um, for helping us in this lawsuit. Uh, we met in August of 2022, uh, Lisa, Jessica, and Sarah and I, and we filed in October. Um, thanks, Beth, with the NCJW, helped get us filed, Beth Solomon. And since we filed this case, I keep coming back to the phrase, the door of a door from generation to generation. This synagogue is more than 175 years old. And this synagogue is the reason we filed this lawsuit. Uh, Lisa and I went to religious school together here. We've known each other since we were six years old. Uh, that's how she approached me, Lisa Sobel, just right here. Um, and she connected me with Jessica. Uh, called and Sarah and Lisa and I not only went to religious school together, we went to high school together at Ballard High School, less than a mile from here, as many of you did in this room. Um, one of the plaintiffs, Sarah Barron, her husband, Dustin Barron, went to high school with Lisa and I. Um, Jessica's husband's father taught my sister English at Ballard High School, but I, I and then the other attorney, Ben Potash, and I, we went to camped together at the Jewish Community Center, and lived together in college. So I mentioned this Jewish geography in high school and these close connections because it really shows how close this community is in Louisville. And I believe that closeness is why our lawsuit, unlike all the others filed across the country, we have named plaintiffs. Every other similar lawsuit was filed by an organization or anonymous plaintiffs. But here, they put their names on this lawsuit. Lisa Sobel, Jessica Cobb, Sarah Barron versus the Attorney General of Kentucky. The only ones in the country. And, and you should know, Lisa, when I get approached by law professors who want to talk about the case, they're like, yeah, we've been studying the Sobel case in school. So it's, it's known as the Sobel case. Yes. And uh, as Rabbi David mentioned, uh, between Lisa, Sarah, Jessica, and myself, we have six daughters, ages three to six. And you know, we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors, and we want to pass on a better world for them from generation to generation, the door of a door. Now, I'll talk a little bit about the law. Uh, Jessica did a great job explaining it, the, the consequences. If you have more questions, you can see me afterwards. But Kentucky defines the moment of fertilization when a sperm and egg meet as a human being. And our lawsuit concerns all the consequences that can come from that. You know, in particular, you know, one issue is during IVF discarding embryos. If, if that's a human being, we fear that they will eventually prosecute the doctors, spouses, other, you know, whoever, for discarding, maybe the mothers, for discarding these embryos. Another large issue with this law, as Jessica pointed out, is that there are no exceptions for fetal viability. A mother has to, to carry the term a fetus that will never become a baby. There are no exceptions for mental health. There is no exception for rape or incest. And these all violate Jewish law. Judaism has never defined life as beginning at conception. And more importantly, in Jewish law, mother's health comes first. That includes mental health. And we all know that in Judaism, you don't choose the life of a fetus over the life of a mother. But the law does not make that clear. The only exception is if a, a mother is facing imminent death. And that is a difficult question of what is imminent. And as you can imagine, that, that puts the doctors in limbo. They're consulting with legal teams on when to have intervention. And it's dangerous to the Commonwealth of Kentucky, and it's against our values. Now, I gave a version of what I just told you last year, and I want to give some updates of what's happened in the last year since I spoke at Reproductive Shabbat last year. Uh, in April of last year, right before Pesach, 
We filed for summary judgment. The attorney general's office filed for summary judgment. The briefs have been in judges chambers since May. For the lawyers in the room, we filed five AOC 280s, but what, you know, to no avail. Um, and um, I wanted to talk about what's happened across the country because last year I talked about our client's fear of prosecution. And while we don't know of prosecutions that's happened right now in Kentucky, there have been some high profile prosecutions of states that have the same laws that we do. If anyone followed in Texas, a woman named Kate Cox had a non viable fetus. They went to the Texas Supreme Court and they told her doctors they would prosecute if they removed that non viable fetus. She had to leave the state. Uh, in Dayton, Ohio, there was an African American woman named Brittany Watts who went to a hospital because her water broke early. The hospital deliberated for two days on whether or not they could terminate the pregnancy based upon Ohio's abortion laws. She eventually went home. While she was at home, she had a uh, miscarriage while she was at home. She ended up hemorrhaging, going back to the hospital. And when she returned from the hospital the third time, uh, she was prosecuted for desecration of a corpse because she had had a miscarriage in her bathroom. Now, when this case got a lot of attention, one month after charging her, they did not indict and the case was dismissed because it got a lot of attention. And that's why it's so important that those of you in this room become aware of everything that's going on. And we need you to be aware that the laws are in the books right now for Kentucky to prosecute when they want to. And there are 120 counties. We don't know everything that goes on in all 120 of these counties. They don't all make the news. We don't know what's happening if women are being, or doctors are under threat of prosecution for just doing normal procedures in health. But we do know that they've already started and going forward, it could happen here. The same Kentucky legislature who passed these laws that run against our values are still passing laws that go against our values. Um, I'd like to draw attention to um, Senator Dr. Berg. She's here tonight. She can tell you more about some things that are happening. And Representative Daniel Grossberg, he's here tonight. These are two representatives who are part of our Jewish community. And they also represent the Commonwealth of Kentucky in Frankfurt. And in the last year since I gave this speech, um, we have passed one of the worst trans bills in the United States it was passed in Kentucky. Um, recently, I know the House passed prayer in school, some Christian evangelists, even um, jealous, and they want to, um, we know this is Christian prayer, and they're like, well, the non-Christians can pray silently, but we all know that that ostracizes other kids in the classroom. And I, I say all this because I want to encourage you to stay active, to be aware, because you all ultimately are what can change these archaic laws. I also would like to give mention to my wife, uh, Shan Kemper. She's here, right there. Um, Shan is uh, from the U.S. Virgin Islands, and uh, we lived there, and when we moved back here, I was hesitant about getting involved in the temple again. I was worried that would they accept our family, and she reached out to Rabbi David, and I'm very thankful that she did, and uh, people have been very welcoming, and you know, I, I've realized since being back here with Shan that uh, this community, we are Kentuckians with as much history and with the same rights as those who oppose us. And as I, as I said earlier, this synagogue's lasted 175 years, but it's been through a lot of buildings. There was a merger, and it's always changing. And, you know, my family and the way we look and who we are we're showing a change towards the future. 
as are many of the other families in here. And I want this synagogue to last in this community for another 175 years. And while this lawsuit has been going for a year and a half and we've had no decision, at this pace, it's probably going to last many, many years to come. But we won't stop, we will not give up, and we won't be deterred. Uh, Uh, we're going to continue to fight this lawsuit, uh, and the way I feel is that we owe it to everyone that has come before us and fought similar lawsuits. We owe it to everyone that's built this community, our ancestors, past, present, and future. Uh, Lador Bador, from generation to generation. Shabbat shalom. Thanks. Thank for their words, but more than their words, as wonderful as they were, and as penetrating to the hearts of everyone here as they were, I want to thank you for going through this hard battle that uh, is not a short one. I can tell you that the reform movement in Israel fought for 14 years for the right to convert uh, Jews, hopefully it won't take uh, 14, but even if it would take 180 years, which is the correct age of our synagogue, <laughs> uh, we, we will stand always in support of this cause and will continue to uh, commemorate here Repo Shabbat as long as needed. Hopefully one day it would look upon as something that no one will understand why we're doing it because it is so obvious that those rights are the rights of every woman here in the Commonwealth of Kentucky and in North America. But Koach, well done in your uh, struggle. 